the Marley Hill community of Life Vineyard Church. In this talk, I'm going to be thinking about possibly the most difficult topic in the Bible, overcoming evil with good. On one hand, this sounds simple. It's really easy to say, overcome evil with good. It's like the doors of the church in Newcastle at the top of Northumberland Street. They have a slogan on the doors that says, hate evil, love good. It's meme worthy. But while it might be really simple to say, it's actually so hard in practice. And unlike memes, which exist in their own context and are meant to be nice, snappy truisms, which we can use to live by, we can't just take a phrase from the Bible on its own and ignore the context. The phrase, overcome evil with good, comes from St Paul's letter to the Romans in the New Testament. It's a letter to a group of new believers in the early church, made up of some Jews and mostly Gentiles, non-Jewish converts to Christianity. And it comes after a long theological explanation about salvation and how it works and how the Jewish scriptures are a backdrop to what Jesus has done in bringing in the new covenant and salvation. And now Paul turns his attention to how the Roman believers should be living in the light of their salvation. So their reading or hearing in that context, this is the basis for your salvation, the justification by faith in Christ Jesus, the role of the Holy Spirit in your lives. And here is what it means. So we need to have that in our minds as we look at this passage too. If you're a Christian, this passage I'm about to read is not showing you the way to earn your salvation. Do this and you'll be okay, more acceptable to God. It's about how you should be living in the light of your salvation. And if you aren't a Christian listening to this, you need to understand that too. This isn't a big list of do's and don'ts, which people say is what the Bible's made up of. This isn't a list of rules to follow, and if you follow them, then you'll be okay. This isn't how you make yourself acceptable to God and the church to earn your salvation. Behaving in the way I'm about to describe won't make you acceptable to God. In fact, trying to live like I'm about to suggest will probably fill you with stress and guilt and difficulties because, spoiler alert, it's not possible for us to carry out all these things with our own will and determination. We need God to help us. Salvation only comes through repentance, trust and belief in Jesus. But once you've asked Jesus to come into your heart, that's when you're able to live, as Paul describes, and to overcome evil with good. So the earlier chapters of Romans are the immediate context to this passage as Paul wrote it, and as the Roman church would have heard it. But the other context that we, as 21st century believers, with the whole Bible at our disposal, need to bear in mind is the words of Jesus himself at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, where he says, go into the world teach them everything that I have taught you. Make, uh, make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. That episode in the story of Jesus is sometimes called the Great Commission. Jesus has been crucified, he was raised to life by God and he spent time with his disciples, teaching them. And this passage takes place just before Jesus goes up to heaven for the last time. It's the last time his disciples see him on earth. And he tells them that this is the mission he's given them on earth now, to teach the people of the world all the things Jesus has taught them as they themselves are going into the world. The verb forms in that passage are continuous present tenses. As you are going, be baptising, be making disciples, be teaching. As you go, wherever you go, be doing these things. So for us, we need to be thinking of that as we go into the world. As we are going, wherever we go, Jesus commands us to be making disciples. So our passage from Romans 12, in its context, is being written to the church in Rome, about 100 believers in a city of a million people, made up of inhabitants from all over the empire, and the church is made up of Jews and Gentile believers who don't have the same backgrounds or culture which is why in the beginning of the letter, 
Paul explains the whole Jewish scriptures as background for believing in Jesus so he can draw links between the two cultures of the people in the church. So now in chapter 12, Paul starts telling the church that what as you're going into the world means for them and for us. So I'm reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible because it gives a bit of elaboration for some of the verses, which I really like, but also because this is quite a well-known passage. And often when I hear or read passages that I know really well, then that familiarity can stop me from really listening or paying attention to what God might want to say to me through it, because I latch onto the stuff that I like and am familiar with, and I sort of ignore the bits and skim over those that I'm not so keen on. But reading or listening to something in a different version can sometimes jar us out of that familiarity uh, and we notice new depths and challenges in the passage. So here we are. This is Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 21. Love is to be sincere and active, the real thing without guile and hypocrisy. Hate what is evil, detest all ungodliness, do not tolerate wickedness, hold on tightly to what is good. Be devoted to one another with authentic brotherly affection as members of one family. Give preference to one another in honour. Never lacking in zeal, a glow in the spirit, enthusiastically serving the Lord, constantly rejoicing in hope because of our confidence in Christ. Steadfast and patient in distress, devoted to prayer, continually seeking wisdom, guidance and strength contributing to the needs of God's people, pursuing the practice of hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, who cause you harm and hardship. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, conceited, self-important, but associate with humble people, those with a realistic self-view. Do not overestimate yourself. Never repay anyone evil for evil. Take thought for what is right and gracious and proper in the sight of everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath and his righteousness. For it is written in scripture, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome and conquered by evil, but overcome evil with good. Simple, yes? No. We can listen to these verses and nod our heads and say, yes, yes, that's the aim. We should do all these things. But if we're honest, can we really do this for every person we meet every day, day after day? In his book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, Pete Scazzaro quotes from Dostoevsky's novel, The The Brothers Karamazov. Um, And there's an episode where a wealthy woman tells a monk that she sometimes dreams of a life of loving service to others. At such a time, she thinks that she will become a sister of mercy. She will live in holy poverty and serve the poor in the humblest way. But then it crosses her mind how ungrateful some of the people she would serve are likely to be. They would probably complain that the soup she served wasn't hot enough, or that the bread wasn't fresh enough, or that the bed was too hard. She confesses that she couldn't bear such ingratitude, and so her dreams about serving others vanish. And she finds herself wondering if there is a God. To this, the wise monk responds, Love in practice is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. These verses from this passage in Romans are underlined in my Bible. I really like them. I love the phrase, love must be sincere. It reminds me of 1 Corinthians 13, the passage about love being patient and kind and not envying that gets read at weddings. And I love verse 13, practice hospitality. I like having people over to our house. I like to practice hospitality. 
And I like it even more when people practice their hospitality on me and I don't have to cook dinner. That's really great. But if we look at some other verses, verse 11, never be lagging in zeal. Not just try to be zealous when you've got some free time and are feeling quite zealous. No, never lag in zeal. Verse 12, enthusiastically serving the Lord, constantly rejoicing in hope, steadfast and patient in distress, even when you are homeschooling and working full time from home in a pandemic. And you can't see because your fringe has grown down to your nose and all the hairdressers are closed and you haven't left the house or had five minutes to yourself for 11 months. When you're at the end of your tether and don't feel enthusiastic or joyful or patient, then keep serving the Lord enthusiastically. Keep rejoicing in hope. Keep being steadfast and patient, even though you're in distress. Not simple at all. And then when you add verse 14 into the mix, bless those who persecute you, who are cruel in their attitude towards you. Bless and do not curse them. Verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. You start to think that Paul must really be having a laugh. <laughs> you may be a Saint Paul, but do you have any idea what I am living through here? Bless the people who are cruel in their attitudes towards me. Give the people who hurt me and upset me something to eat. How is that possible? How can someone overcome evil with good? In 1977, a book called The Hiding Place was published. You might have heard it. It was by a lady called Corrie ten Boom, who was the daughter of a Dutch watchmaker. And she and her sister and her father, they hid some Jews in a secret room in their house during the Second World War. And one day they were betrayed to the Nazis and Corrie and her sister Betsy were taken to Ravensbrück concentration camp. So Corrie ten Boom found herself in a concentration camp in her 50s because she had tried to act to show how God's love against a backdrop of the Nazi regime. The conditions in the camp were hard and food was scarce. Corrie's older sister, Betsy, was weaker than Corrie and suffered terribly from the conditions. But both sisters tried to keep Jesus as their focus all the time. However, one day they found out something that made that even harder than before. They found out the name of the man who had betrayed them to the Germans. His name was Jan Vogel. Corrie writes, Flames of fire seemed to leap around that name in my heart. I thought of father's final hours, alone and confused in a hospital corridor, of the underground work so abruptly halted. And I know that if Jan Vogel stood in front of me now, I could kill him. All of me ached with the violence of my feelings about the man who had done so much harm. That night, I did not sleep, and the next day at my bench, I scarcely heard the conversation around me. By the end of the week, I had worked myself into such a sickness of body and spirit that Mr. Mormon, her supervisor at the camp, stopped at my bench to ask if something were wrong. Wrong? Yes, something's wrong. And I plunged into an account of that morning. I was only too eager to tell Mr. Mormon and all Holland how Jan Vogel has betrayed his country. Despite the fact that she was a Christian and sincerely loved Jesus, despite the fact that she was seeking to serve God and share his love in the darkness of the concentration camp, Corrie ten Boom found that she was overcome with hatred when faced with the evil of her betrayer. She was in the world, carrying out the Great Commission as best she could, going and making disciples in the hardest circumstances but she struggled not to be overcome by evil. However, Betsy, Corrie's sister, took a different approach. Corrie continues, What puzzled me all this time was Betsy. She had suffered everything I had, and yet she seemed to carry no burden of rage. 
Betsy, I hissed one dark night when I know that my restless tossing must be keeping her awake. Three of us now shared this single cot as the crowded camp daily received new arrivals. Betsy, don't you feel anything about Jan Vogel? Doesn't it bother you? Oh yes, Corrie, terribly, Betsy replied. I have felt for him ever since I knew, and I pray for him whenever his name comes into my mind. How dreadfully he must be suffering. Unlike Corrie, Betsy Ten Boom was able not to be overcome by evil, and as she prayed for the man who had betrayed her family and sent her to Ravensbrook concentration camp, Betsy was able to overcome evil with good, to bless those who persecuted her. Most of us will never experience evil like the Nazi concentration camps or the Holocaust or murder or the evil acts that horrify our society and fill our newspapers. But we will suffer wrong at the hands of others and often we will react in the same way that Corrie Ten Boom describes. We feel anger towards those who cut us up when we're driving, talk about us behind our back, treat us badly. On our own, day by day, we find it hard not to be overcome by evil. And that's why this challenge, passage in Romans is such a challenge for us. If we've been around church a while and heard the passage read and are familiar with it, it can be nice and comforting. We start to think, yes, we can do this. But the thing is, we need to be able to do it all day, every day. And not just when we're feeling zealous and on fire for God and all seems OK with the world and we totally feel like we can do all things. But on the bad days, in the middle, middle of a pandemic, when things don't turn out the way we expect or want. Not just when we feel a bit offended and are able to shrug it off, but when, like the ten booms, we know someone has acted maliciously against us. This fight with ourselves not to be overcome by evil isn't a new thing in the world. As I said, most of us won't encounter what the world would describe as completely evil every day of our lives. We don't live in desperately hard and damaging situations. But another word for what the Bible calls evil is sin. Sin is the acting out of all that goes against God and his love. Sin, both ours and other people's, is what we need to overcome with good. This isn't a new struggle. Back in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, we can see how a struggle to overcome evil with good plays out, and not for the better. In chapter four, we read about the sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favour. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Cain was upset and angry that his offering wasn't pleasing to God, but his brother Abel's was. I don't want to look at this passage in detail, but just focus on what God says to Cain. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. God says that Cain has a choice. It's not an easy choice. Sin is waiting like a wild animal ready to pounce. The image suggests that Cain will have to fight sin, but God says that he must rule over it. Cain needs to choose to rule over the sin in his life, despite the fact that this will be a fight, a battle to do what's right. And if you know the story, later on, Cain takes Abel into the fields and murders him. He is overcome by sin, overcome by evil. He can't make the right choice. He can't overcome evil with good. 
And so often we feel like Cain. In the past, I've been hurt, let down, treated badly, shunned, suffered at the hands of other people. Not to the extent of Corrie ten Boom and the other prisoners in a concentration camp, but I've been wounded to my soul by things that have been said or done to me. And in those moments, when I felt like I can't breathe because the hurt is so great and it completely consumed me, I knew there's no way I had the strength to carry out those words in Romans. I didn't know how to overcome evil with good. And that feels very negative. It somehow feels wrong to say that something's impossible because it feels like we're defeated. We can't do it. We failed. But to say that something's impossible, it doesn't mean that we failed. In fact, the opposite is true. It's actually very liberating because when you realise that something's impossible for you, you also realise it's not about you to try and do it on your own. We go back to our passage in Romans. Before Paul gets to this point, he says in chapter 11, verse 36, For from him, God, and through him and to him are all things. So what does that mean? All things originate with him, with God, and come from God. And all things live through God. He is the beginning and ending of all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, Paul carries on and starts chapter 12. Brothers and sisters, I beg of you because of this. Because of what? Because of what Paul just said. Because in God and through God and in from God are all things. All things are in God and from him and back to him. And because of that, because God is in control, because of that, I'm begging you, Paul says, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your whole mind, by its new ideals and its new attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. So if in the natural worldly way we are consumed with hate and injustice like Koi Ten Boom from the way we've been treated, we can't bless those who persecute us. But if we believe that in him and from him and through him are all things and our minds can be transformed, they can be changed and we can think and do and move in ways beyond the patterns of the, what the world says, then maybe... Romans 12, 9 to 21, is possible. But how do you get there? You get there by presenting yourself as a living sacrifice to God. And how do you do that? By deciding and saying to God, God, I present myself as a living sacrifice to you. Use me, change me, renew my mind. When I make that conscious decision to present myself to God and trust and believe that he will fill me and enable me and transform my way of thinking, then I can act in a way that is impossible for me naturally and instinctively. I can do it in the strength that he will give me. When I have been lying on the floor, metaphorically, with my life in pieces around me, knowing what I should do, what is the right thing to do, but not having the strength to do it. I have known Jesus enable me to stand up and make the choice not to give in to what is wrong because he has transformed my spirit and renewed my mind. It's really hard. It's really hard to be out in the world with people that hurt you and let you down and betray you and scare you and lie to you. And sometimes the temptation to stay inside, to keep away from the world where it's safe, is so strong. But we have to go into the world. 
of all the injustice out there, of all the terrible things out there, the worst thing that we can do is not go. Because if we don't go, then good loses. If our goal is to self-protect and self-defend, then we lose. We just hand evil the world and they go, and go, don't come and get me. You can have all of that, but don't hurt me. Don't come and get me. You lose. We can say, I don't like people out there. I'm not going to go out and risk myself for them. Why would any normal person do that? A normal person wouldn't but a transformed person would and can. And that is why when we go into the world, we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can't have a false view of the world and of ourselves and try and go out there. We have to be real. We have to know that we are more than conquerors, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, that nothing can do that. Nothing out there can separate you from God. Nothing, not death, not life, not the demonic, nothing can separate you. Do you really believe that? Do you know that you are the temple of the living God? Because if you know that, then you can go out there and vanquish evil with good. Corrie ten Boom was out in the world. Her family made a choice to protect the Jews who were being persecuted by the Nazis. And as a result, they were betrayed and imprisoned. The Ten Booms weren't Jews, they were Christians. They weren't in immediate danger themselves. They could have kept their heads down and they'd have been okay. They'd have seen out the war, but they chose to try and stop evil from winning. Corrie struggled with anger and hatred towards her betrayer but her sister, Betsy, demonstrated how to come, overcome evil with good, even when she seemed to reach the end of herself. She showed how to master the sin of hating someone who wrongs you and instead do good to those who persecute you. Corrie ten Boom said that after she heard her sister show such pity to the man who had betrayed them to the Germans, she said, for a long time, I lay silent in the huge shadowy barracks, restless with the sighs, snores and stirrings of hundreds of women. Once again, I had the feeling that this sister, with whom I had spent all my life, belonged somehow to another order of things. Wasn't she telling me in her gentle way that I was as guilty as Jan Vogel? Didn't he and I stand together before an all-seeing God, convicted of the same sin of murder? For I had murdered him with my heart and with my tongue. Lord Jesus, I whispered into the lumpy tickling of the bed, I forgive Jan Vogel as I pray that you will forgive me. I have done him great damage. Bless him now and his family. That night, for the first time since our betrayer had a name, I slept deep and dreamlessly until the whistle summoned us to roll call. Corrie realised the very thing that Paul has been explaining in the early chapters of Romans. She remembered that she had done wrong and been forgiven by God, just as Jan Vogel needed to be forgiven. And when we find ourselves in situations where we feel legitimately aggrieved and angry about something that someone has done to wrong us, Jesus reminds us that he understands just what we're going through. He understands betrayal, hurt, lies, rejection. And more, Jesus shed his blood for those sins committed by others. When I feel hurt and vengeful that another sin is damaging me, I need to recall that I haven't bled because of that sin. But Jesus has died for it. And he's bled and died for my sin as well which is ultimately how we can overcome evil with good, by knowing deep in our hearts, minds and souls that Jesus has overcome our evil, our sin, with his love, his goodness. And that proves that good is stronger than evil. If we allow our lives to be consumed by his love and goodness, 
He will give us the strength and ability to act in a way that contrasts with the world's thinking and shine his light everywhere we go. God doesn't cause the pain and suffering around us, but he uses it to strengthen us, to teach us, to mature us. And when we are mature and when we're ready and when we know our true identity and when we're not afraid of the evil out there, this is what we need to do. We need to go out and counter the injustices and evil that we find. Refugees being kicked out of their countries, human trafficking, drugs, violence, racism. And we can do that if we understand forgiveness. If we don't know how to receive forgiveness from God for anything in our life, and we don't know how to extend forgiveness outwards into a lost world, then we're going to be stuck forever. Like Corrie ten Boom, we will be trapped. We need to open our arms to God and say, I accept the flood of your forgiveness for any part of my life where I fear guilt and shame. I take it, I receive it. And then, if there's anyone out there, Lord, that I refuse to forgive, then help me release them. We don't have to agree them, be with them or like them. We just need to let it go. And when we understand and live in the forgiveness that God has extended to us, and we can realise and manifest our identity in Christ as the beloved of God, with our minds transformed to his pattern, then we can go into the world and be all that Romans 12 urges us to be. We can be the type of Christ follower that the theologian Samuel Chadwick describes. He says, spirit-filled souls are ablaze for God. They love with a love that glows. They serve with a faith that kindles. They serve with a devotion that consumes. If we can live like that, then we will not be overcome by evil. But with God's help, we'll be able to overcome evil with good. Music